Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Never was a nation faced with such a decisive choice uh, between two different persons. On the one hand, you had an extremely powerful woman married to a powerful and charismatic leader, a scoundrel nonetheless, but certainly beloved by many. But this woman had the backing of a majority, a large majority of the people, and she had minions at her command to carry out all of her orders that she might give. The ruling class, of course, glommed on to her and hoped to ride her train to the prominence and privilege and wealth and advantage that they uh, paid for. They paid for the right to have that, uh, in fact. But they wanted to ride that train into generations to come. And she had, through her influence in international arenas, of course, made alliances, some of them secret, with powerful regimes far beyond the borders of her own country. So powerful was she that when her husband had gotten into a land dispute with another man uh, and it wasn't going his way, he pouted around about it until she decided to step in. And she, of course, was well versed in the ways of the law of the land and so uh, had charges trumped up against this landowner and eventually, of course, led to his execution for crimes he didn't commit. Uh, bottom line, her greedy mis miscreant husband was able to get the man's land. Whenever she appeared in public, she was highly uh, made up, of course. She looked younger than she really was and more charming than her servants or her bodyguards or even her aged husband would have admitted. Her makeup and her dress, the beautiful women that she surrounded herself with, her ready smile, her winsome side glances uh, belied the deep cruelty of her driving lust for power. In every way, she was the picture of the God of this world that she worshipped and that she served. The alternative to her was a man who would have rather remained outside the millstream of politics but was thrust into it by his passion and his love for his nation. He was a plain smoke spoken man. Uh, some would even say he was brash and insensitive. Uh, he had his supporters uh, but they were characterized as low lowlifes and deplorable. He was criticized for everything from his hairstyle to his dress. Uh, nonetheless, he spoke his mind and there, was, there were some who resonated uh, to what he proclaimed. In a showdown with some of her uh, forward-thinking minions, this uh, gruff yet uh, sincere man ended up defeating those who had, he, she had sent after him with trumped up charges and allegations. He continued to be vilified uh, by her rhetoric uh, with the willing assistance, of course, of the cadre of supporters within the country's elite. Of course, you know who I'm talking about, and I'm not afraid to speak the name out loud, uh, whatever you may think. Her name is Jezebel, the high priestess of Ashrat Shembaal, the goddess of the Sidonians. What? <laughs> Don't tell me you were thinking about somebody else. <laughs> this is a sermon in a Christian church. We're going to talk. We're going to go to the Bible here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, Jezebel is in the Bible. <laughs> She was the daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal was the pagan king of Sidon. And she uh, became queen of Israel by being married off to the apostate king of Israel, Ahab. Now you can read about her story and her power and her rise to power, her marriage to the, Israeli, to the uh, king of Israel. Not the king of Judah now, the king of Israel. It's a divided kingdom now. You have Judah in the south and Israel in the north. Uh, her husband was Ahab, the son of Omri, who was a, a terribly pagan king. And her eventual demise can all be read about under uh, when she, uh, the conquest of Jehu, whom God through Elijah, the prophet Elijah, had uh, designated as the one to reform Israel. Uh, and you can read about this uh, beginning in 1 Kings 16 all the way to 2 Kings 9. 
Uh, and uh, the opponent, her chief opponent, of course, was the prophet Elijah. And he was criticized. He was a man who ran around in camel's hair, you know. He was a prophet. In fact, he thought he was the only prophet. So, uh, so politically correct had she made Baalism in, uh, in Israel that the prophets of Yahweh were actually hidden in caves for fear that they would be decimated by her. And so uh, Elijah was the only one left. And it was Elijah, of course, who challenged all the prophets of Baal, which were all her cadre, all her friends, all the ones she had appointed to be the uh, one who would lead Israel into Baal worship, of which she was the high priestess of the female side of that deity. And so he takes them onto Mount Carmel. He has this big, uh, this, this big cookout up there. There's been a three-year drought now. There's no water, but he has this big cookout. And he sets up a big altar there, and he calls all the prophets of Baal up there that will come. And, and uh, he calls all the Israelites to come up there who, who want to see this. And they put a big uh, uh, ox on this pile of wood and stuff, and they are going to uh, call fire down from heaven. This is the man that is opposing Jezebel, is opposing Ahab. The Baal uh, prophets are given the first, first chance. So the Baal prophets are, are given the first chance. If they build the altar, put the fuel on it, put the wood on it, put the sacrifice on it, then they have to start, then Baal has to start the fire. And so he says to the prophets, he says, now we're going to have this sacrifice to Baal. Let Baal take it. Let Baal come down and, and, and bring the fire and take this sacrifice. And so they dance around and dance around the... Uh, I would love to have been there. That probably would have made National Geographic, I'm sure. <laughs> but I would have loved to have been there. But they dance around and dance around and dance around, and uh, uh, nothing happens. And so Elijah says to him, you know, Baal is a god. Maybe he's gone on a journey, or maybe he's in the bathroom. I mean, you know, we don't know he's a god. Come on, you know, you guys got to do better than this. Then they start cutting themselves, and flagellating themselves and screaming and nothing happens. And they exhaust themselves. They're just completely exhausted. They're down on the ground exhausted. Okay? And so he says, okay, those of you who are for Yahweh God or for the Lord, come close. And he has water. Now water is very, very scarce now, but he has water poured all over the sacrifice. He has a ditch around the sacrifice with nothing but water. Just, it's all covered, soaked and then he calls upon the name of the Lord. <laughs> Fire comes down. It takes the sacrifice. It takes the fuel. It takes the rocks. And it takes all the water out of the ditch. That's the man who was opposing Jezebel and Ahab. That was the God who is in charge. It didn't end well for the prophets of Baal that day. It did not ultimately end well for Jezebel. There are 12 principles. You have them there in your, in your outline. These 12 principles that I want to speak to today from the Scripture that lets us know that whatever the machinations of men are politically or governmentally or societally, God still rules. And He'll rule today and He will rule Wednesday. And after Wednesday. It is God who rules. And these are the principles which are set up in, in Scripture. The sovereign authority of God is not, is not done away with. Done away with by, by man's knowledge, science, or politics. That's not what does away with the sovereignty of God. It is always there and He's sovereign in the affairs of men. Let's look at these 12 principles. And now I'm giving you just a, a 12 scriptures that relate to these. There are the scripture, if the scripture teaches anything, it teaches that God, the creator of the universe, is still in charge of his universe. God, the creator of humanity and of mankind, has a plan for man. And it was um, made manifest for us in his son, Jesus Christ. So from creation to, to, to the day in which we live, God has been at work. If you look at Exodus 18, 16 we see the principle that we are to be governed by God's statutes and laws. Man is to be governed. 
uh, by God's statutes and laws, not the ones we make up, the ones we think are fairest or anything like that. Although they may reflect God's, it's his statutes and laws. And that's why if you visit the Supreme Court building, you'll notice that on the relief uh, freeze at the top of the building, you see Moses. Okay, because we're to be ruled by God's laws and statutes. It says in Exodus 18, 16. Now this is at a time when, when Moses sat and judged the people. He would sit and the people would bring their, their complaints to him. And go, How should we act in this, with this? How should we act this? What are we supposed to do in this circumstance? How should we follow what God wants with this situation? Now you're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And Moses was acting as the supreme judge. God's man was acting simply, the prophet was acting as the supreme judge. Well, his father-in-law, Jethro, comes along and says, you, you can't continue doing this. He says, you've got people standing out here in the sun all day long, and they don't even get close to talking to you about what they want. You, you, can't, run a, you can't run a people like this. He says, you need to start assigning people. In other words, create a government. Create a government that will make this happen the way it's supposed to happen. Set up judges. You know, set up uh, legislators, set up scribes, set up people who can take care of this, his father tells him. And Moses takes his, his, his advice. And this is what he said. When they have a dispute, have them come to, uh, have, them, uh, have them come to me to decide between one and another, and I make them to know the statutes of God and his laws. And Jethro says, that's great. You get some people to help you. In other words, form a government. But that government is based on the statutes and the laws of God. The second principle, the state and statists, people who believe in the state and the power of the state, can never replace the sovereign God. The state never does that. Never does. And never in, in any situation in the world have we ever seen a, 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 a state uh, endure where it was simply the state and people served the state. That, that always transitioned into something else, either by violent revolution or by uh, the mere, uh, the mere uh, weight of the bureaucracy. It usually changes. So the state and status can never replace the sovereign God. Okay? It says in Exodus 20, you shall have no other gods before you. It, it starts out that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, that place of bondage. You will have no other gods before me. You will make no image of any god, either in the heavens and earth, uh, 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 on, on the land and the sea below. I am the Lord your God. You will have no other God. The state can never become the God. It can never become the absolute power. That belongs to God. It will always belong to God and it will belong in, in, in its uh, proper condition amongst those who are governed by the statutes and laws of God. Number three, God is, is to be feared in the affairs of men. There is to be a healthy fear of God in the affairs of men. Men, as they carry out the government uh, amongst the people or the responsibilities they have for the people, are to fear the God who has established government. They are to fear the God who has established this created order. And He is to be feared in the, in, in the affairs of men. We, we're not to neglect who God is and how God has formed His world to be governed. And so we shall fear the Lord your God, it says in Deuteronomy 10, 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve Him, hold fast to Him. And by His name you will swear. Well, in the courts of this country and in the legislature, everyone who's sworn into government service in this country takes an oath before the state. They take an oath before the governor. They take an oath before the president. They take a fourth before the chief judge. Who do they take an oath to? You're in a court of law. Do you take an oath to the judge? Who do you take an oath to? God. I swear to the truth of all, so help me, God. And we've always done this. Now it's become simply ceremonial, which makes it a blasphemy in a sense that people don't really believe what they're saying, especially those who would... Who would uh, claim that they would uphold the Constitution no matter what, and yet every turn they get, try to destroy it. So clearly, if you're making an oath, you ought to make it to the God you should fear. You should fear. No one should fear the, the penalties of the state more than those of God. 
Because God has set up the affairs of man. Number four, God's lordship over the earth is absolute. Is absolute. Now, He may share it charismatically with certain leaders, people who are uh, uh, have a certain uh, care and love for the people, the communities in which they serve, and serve in God's name in those positions, whether they be in, in uh, legislative uh, positions, uh, uh, in the area of jurisprudence, uh, in the area of, of uh, law enforcement, it doesn't matter. Whatever they're in, they serve knowing that they serve God in that, first of all. It says in Psalm 83, 17 and following, let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace. That are those who oppose God. Those who are opposed to God. Those who oppose the law of God. And he says this, that they may know that you, O Lord God, alone, whose name is the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. Most High means above everything else. There's no human government that's above God. There's no human institution. There's no science above Him. Uh, there's no philosophy above Him. He is highest. And, and number five, God alone is to be trusted. He's God. So He is to be trusted. And there's nothing about Him as He's revealed in the Scriptures that He should not be trusted. But He should be trusted. It says in Psalm 91 too. I will say to the Lord, and the word Lord there is to Yahweh God, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So my major trust is in Him. I put all of my trust ultimately in Him. That whatever befalls, either the state, my community, or myself, I'm in His hands. That will never change. No matter what the vicissitudes of this life and broken world may bring to me, I still will trust in Him. You want to hear an amazing thing? And if I'm not wrong, if I'm wrong, someone can correct me. You want to hear an amazing thing? How, how, how people really understand that, that God is really in charge. How they just go around and say, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. People just say, it's a miracle. Oh, nobody was killed, it was just a miracle. What was it, last week, maybe a week before when you had three or four major earthquakes in central Italy. Central Italy. I mean, they show pictures of towns right through the middle of town. Everything just collapsed. Everything collapsed. And if I'm not mistaken, no one died in that. No one died in it. You see? God's in charge of all things. Even if, even if the earth is going to shake and rattle. All right, I'll finish it and roll. Okay? <laughs> even if it does do that, ladies and gentlemen, God is in charge. It is a broken world, we know. And He will one day redeem it unto what it was meant to be. But we will trust in Him, whatever the circumstances that befall. Number six. And this is a bit, little bit longer passage, but it's, it's well worth remembering. The quality of God's sovereign headship, the quality now of His headship, cannot be replaced by human institutions. There's nothing about simple human institutions that can ever replace the sovereign headship of God, which He has established, as we know as New Testament Christians, upon His Son, Jesus Christ. Listen to this text from uh, a very famous text from Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, 6-7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulders, and His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, if you, if you think about this, we, we say it in that way. We use uh, uh, an adjective and a noun. We say Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But it could be read, it could be read, that He shall be called, He shall be called Wonderful. Sometimes when the prophets and the patriarchs would ask who the angel was and they wanted to know the name of an angel, the angel would say, why do you ask me on my name? It's Wonderful. He could be Counselor. Jesus told His disciples, I'm going to send you another Counselor. 
Well, what does it mean another counselor? Because Jesus is the first counselor. He will be mighty. Mighty. Mighty there means almighty. means powerful over all things. He is God, the only God. He is everlasting. He didn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. He's Father because He has a fatherly care for His creation. He cares for us as a father cares for children. He's a prince because He rules. And He is peace. Shalom. A peace that only God can give. This is who this person is. And that is why His headship cannot be replaced by anything human beings have. Or can give. Or can establish. Or create. Of His increase... Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. In other words, on him will be established an everlasting rule and an everlasting rule that will be in shalom, peace. There will be no end to that peace. And whose throne does he have? He will take the throne of David over this, over his king, which means what? Well, if you go back to Romans chapter 1... As St. Paul says, we know that by human descent he was a son of David. But by his everlasting origin, he was a son of God. This one that God was going to send, okay? He will have the throne of his father David. He will rule in this world one day forever. And his kingdom he will establish. And it will be upheld. With what? Justice and righteousness. See, every time you have justice and righteousness carried out, you're carrying out the will of God. From this time forth and forevermore, there'll be no end whatsoever to this rule that God will establish under the headship of His Son, Jesus Christ. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to do this. This is the God we trust. There's no institution... Nothing among men that we can create that can, can replace that. That is the means of salvation, the way of salvation, the way to the everlasting kingdom is through Christ. This is the one God has established. That's how we have access to God. No one comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Number seven, Daniel. Here's a, here's a principle set up here. Whatever the political system or process, whatever that might be, the Most High rules over the kingdoms of men. The, the Most High rules over the kingdoms of men. Now, the context of Daniel 4 is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is ruling in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had set up, set up a statue of himself, 90 feet high, a gold statue, and every his body was supposed to worship it. Worship this statue, right? If you didn't, every time the, there was a big uh, band, whatever the band would play, everybody would have fall down to this big statue of Nebuchadnezzar because he was a great god of the world, uh, whatever. He was a great son of the God, right? He was the Messiah. He was the one who has come to help people and, and to rule forever. And there were three Hebrews that wouldn't do that. We all know their name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they decided they weren't going to do that. So he threw them in the fiery furnace, and what happened? What happened? Something got burned up in that furnace. What got burned up in that furnace? The bonds that were holding them. That's the only thing burned up. They came sauntering out of this furnace. The furnace was heated so hot that the servants who threw were open when it, when the door was open to throw these guys in, the servants were burned up. That's how hot it was. All right? So God judges him. God judges him. This is the judgment. It's in Daniel chapter two, four, verse thirty two. And he says, And you, O Nebuchadnezzar, shall be driven from among men. And you shall dwell, uh, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be ma made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you. Seven years, let's say. Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. And give it to whom He will. And so one of the principles is that the political system and, and the process is irrelevant when it comes to who's ruling amongst the kingdoms of men. And that is God. And that is why in every place in the world, from the time of the apostles to this day, you have Christians who cannot be stomped out by their oppressive governments. They cannot be eliminated. 
no matter how hard they try to eliminate them. Even, even uh, uh, Stalin was probably uh, responsible for the killing of two million Christians. And he couldn't stomp them out. You can't. God will have his kingdom. He will have his people. And no system can go against it. And so he proved that to Nebuchadnezzar. He proved it to Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar came out of this, he made a proclamation that all through his kingdom, they should also worship the God of the Hebrews. Number eight. All human authority among men comes from God. And that's John 19, 11. Jesus answered him. You, the, the, Jesus is standing before Pilate. He's about to be turned over to be crucified. Pilate says, don't you know I have the authority to crucify you or the authority to release you? And this is what Jesus says to Pilate now, who was sovereign for Rome. For the, he, he represented the emperor. His word was the emperor's word in Jerusalem, in Palestine. And this is what he said. Well, I can let you go or I can crucify you. I have that authority. And this is what Jesus said to him. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. And when he said it had been given to you from above, he didn't mean the emperor. And Pilate knew he didn't mean the emperor. Because what does Pilate want to do after he says this to him? He wants to let him go. Therefore, he who delivered you, uh, me over to you has a greater sin. Because they know better. You are set up by the Roman authority. I expect you to act like the Roman. Jesus is basically saying, I expect you to act like a Roman. I expect you to act like a Roman authority. But you have to understand something. That authority doesn't come from you or from the emperor. It comes from God. And if God weren't doing it, you'd have no authority. His wife comes to him and says, you know, Pilate, you shouldn't have anything to do with this righteous man because I've suffered a lot in a dream because of him. And so Pilate sought to release him by setting up this, this bogus Barabbas, but that didn't work. No authority that it wasn't given to you by God. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Our call, therefore, with knowing all of this, what is our call? Our call is simply to do what? Obey God. Obey God. This is what the apostles said when they're dragged in front of the Sanhedrin because of a miracle that happened in the name of Jesus. And they're dragged before the Sanhedrin. But Peter and the apostles answered the Sanhedrin this way. We must obey God rather than men. Because they said, look, we don't want you speaking in His name anymore. No more of this praying in the name of Jesus anymore. Can't have any of that. Can't speak the name of Jesus in public. Have we ever heard that before? And that's what He told them. And He said, what are we going to do? Are we Are going to obey you or are we going to obey God? Obey God. What is called upon, if God is ruling and God is king and His absolute authority and sovereignty over the world is true, then who do I obey? I obey God. And if to speak in the name of Jesus is appropriate, I will speak in the name of Jesus. I will speak in the name of Jesus. I will speak in His name. I had a, a public school teacher. He, he uh, was a member of my congregation. was an elder for a while. And uh, he, he taught in public school. And, uh, and he... Uh, had to world history in one of his courses. He always spent two weeks on the Reformation, which is just a, just a page, basically, in a world history book. He spent two weeks. Every time he taught the lesson, he spent two weeks on the Reformation. And it was Jesus talk all the time. Okay? So we will do it because we will obey the Lord. We will obey the Lord. And uh, Romans 13, 1, all legitimate authority that exists on earth is from God. If it's legitimate authority, the authority of parents over their children, the authority of teachers over, over children that put in their charge, the authority of legislatures over those who elected them, the authority of, of judges over criminals, all authority that we exercise in our civil lives, in, this, in our public lives in this world, all of that authority exists on earth it is from God. From God. Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those who exist and those that exist have been, in other words, those authorities that do exist. And here he means legitimate authorities. Now he doesn't say that, but that is understood in this text. Those legitimate authorities, those that exist, have been instituted by God all the way from the time when Jethro told Moses, you ought to set up a little government here in order to handle this vast number of people that God has plans for. 
Colossians, for number 11, Colossians 1. Our loyalty, therefore, our loyalty is to the everlasting King who has saved us by His blood. And whenever you have a state that, that says that everyone in the, in, uh, under their authority and control must serve the state, the state is sovereign over anything else in your life, then you can imagine why they don't want the Bible in their country. You can understand why they don't want preachers converting people to Christianity in their country. Because you can't have God and the state. Okay? You can have God with the state, the state with God, but you can't have the state over Him. And so our loyalty is with the everlasting King who has saved us by His blood. We are saved to be in a different kingdom. We're citizens of a different country. Of a different country. It says in uh, Colossians 1, around 16 and following, it says, For by Him all things were created. By Him He's talking about the, the Son of God, the Christ. By Him all things were created in heaven and earth, everything visible and invisible, as we say in our creed, whether thrones or dominations or rulers or authorities. He's talking about the spiritual realm and the physical realm. Whatever realm of authority there is, in heaven, on earth, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He's over all of them. All things were created through Him, which means all authority was created through Him. All government was created through Him. And He is before all things, which means He's eternal. And He, in Him, all things hold together. He's the provincial glue of the universe. And He is the head of His body, the church. So the church, in a sense, is His kingdom here. The one where He rules because He is the head and acknowledged head of it. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, the resurrected Savior, that in everything He is preeminent above everything else. For in Him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in bodily form. God's own authority was exercised in His own mercy, love, peace, and grace and salvation in Jesus Christ. And through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, the Prince of Peace, making peace by the blood of His cross. This is why our loyalty is with Him. This is why our loyalty is with Him. And every German Lutheran that, that took the loyalty oath to der Führer, der Führer, and there were some who wouldn't, and they paid the price for it. They paid the price for not wanting to take that oath. Because they knew the state, and no man in any state can ever have my oath of loyalty. Only God can have it. Only God can have it. And, pro and finally, number 12. 12 principle that we find here. Eternal dominion in heaven and earth belongs to Christ. The eternal dominion belongs to Him. It's His now, and it will be His throughout all eternity. Throughout all eternity. He who is the blessed, it says in 1 Timothy 6, 15 and following, He who is the blessed and only Sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let the peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.